Okay, I hope that you answered your bellwork question at the top of page one. These notes are going to be quick um, because the kinodermata are just one phyla, phylum of um, organism C creature that we have to learn about, but you can see they're very varied. All right. So, one of our topics is we have to state the main features from uh, Unit 4 of the typical echinoderm limited to pentaradial symmetry and tube feet. Penta, five, okay? Radial symmetry. So, echinoderm means spiny skinned. The echinodermata are spiny skinned organisms. That's how they are classified. Sea urchins, sea stars. There are some examples in the classroom that look like this. These are just the, obviously, skeleton of the um, organisms. They'll be up there in the cabinet if you ever wanted to see them. Maybe for when you're drawing the sample um, that you have to do for your um, field guide. Okay, they might come in handy. But they're not living. So that may be detrimental to your picture. You want to make sure you have a drawing a living organism, okay? And they have radial symmetry, except for the larvae. The larvae are bilaterally um, symmetrical, like remember people are, okay? Um, radial meaning they have, um, or pent radial, one, two, three, four, five, five, Sec, you know, five sections. So they have a symmetry, a radial uh, symmetry, and m many of them are pentaradial, but so there are, some of them have multiple arms, more than, and I'll show you some later, more than five. So <clears throat> they have an oral side and an aboral side, okay? The oral side has the mouth, and the aboral surface has other things, okay, which we will talk about. Um, they have an endoskeleton, so inside, it's, that's, that's what makes them tough, okay. And they have a WVS, a, a water vascular system, and that enables this to happen. Their tube feet are controlled by this almost like um, hydraulics, okay. And there's this thing called a madraparite right there on the surface of a sea star and other echinodermata, echinoderms, that here's a close-up of it, that is almost like a sieve. Uh, it's got microscopic pores in it that allow water to come in and out um, and controlling these two feet. So it enables them to locomote, loc um, you know, to, to move, okay? Um, and even to feed and hunt. These are predators. Many of them, not all of them. Some of them are detritivores. They just feed on the, on the, you know, the ground. I'll show you that in a minute. The soil in the, in the bottom of the ocean, the substrate. So you're gonna be drawing something like this um, for your scientific illustration. So we're gonna go through the different classes now of uh, echinoderms. There are sea stars. They have anywhere from five to 50 arms. Yes, some of them have multiple more, you know, more than five. <clears throat> they come from a central disc. They have tube feet that protrude from that oral surface, radiating along canals called umbilical grooves, okay? And they prey upon bivalves, which are um, Clams and mollusks and oysters, bivalve, bi meaning two, valve meaning shell, bivalves, snails, barnacles, etc., etc. So, all different kinds. We have uh, we have these here in Florida. The, <coughs> the Bermuda star. It also has a different name. I forget, but I found one of these snorkeling over in um, Coral Cove which is like near Jupiter, by the, just north of the lighthouse, right there. So we have some neat stuff here. Brittle stars, we have lots of these here as well. 
They have five long, flexible, snake-like arms. As you can see them wriggling around here. They come in all different sizes. They also um, don't have tube feet. They, um, they lack, well, they have them, but they don't, have, sorry, the tube feet don't have suckers on them. They're just used for um, feeding, okay? And there's approximately 2,000 species. More than any other spiny skin, more than any other echinoderm, are the species of these brittle stars. Sea urchins. They have an endoskeleton that forms a round, rigid test, like this. Just like it's pictured right there, okay? And um, they graze along the bottom. Sometimes they cover themselves with camouflage. They camouflage themselves. They eat plant material, sponges, organisms called bryozoans. Um, their mouth has an intricate set of jaws called Aristotle's lantern. So these are bitey, the bitey parts, okay? And they are used uh, to bite algae from the bottom. They kind of like, they graze. They walk around, not walk around there, but they move around with tube feet. They have tube feet that come out from their spines. And they move around. If you capture one, you can hold it in your hand and eventually it'll get comfortable enough as long as it's like in water a little bit you can hold it like at the surface and it'll start to move across the surface of your hand it won't bite you don't worry um and these are this is called a diadema these we have in the keys we have these are very long spines and they're um uh, i believe they're endangered and you can when you step on these it's not fun okay we were on the west coast at Fort DeSoto Park and near Saint, just south of St. Petersburg. And Mrs. Keene stepped on one of those and I had to pull the spines out, dig the spines out from her feet. They're not venomous, but obviously they don't feel very good, right? It feels like stepping on a bunch of pins or getting a bunch of thick splinters. Yeah. So sand dollars are a type of echinoid with flattened test. So the sand dollar, this one's broken. Um, it's supposed to be totally round, okay, like that, right? Um, they are just like this, the sea urchin, but flat, okay? And this is what they look like when they're alive. They have a coating of these little um, tube feet, but again, no suckers, okay? And they crawl around through the substrate, sand and dirt, whatever, picking up um, food particles into their mouth. And you see how they have very similar umbil umbilical, not umbilical, umbilical, okay, grooves along their body, just like a sea star, and they have the um, pent, pentaradial symmetry, right? And they have all their internal organs inside, their Aristotle's lantern, their intricate mouth parts, Sea cucumbers, different class now. They don't have any spines, even though they're still considered echinoderms. They have no radial symmetry. Their endoskeleton, the thing that makes up the, you know, the inside of their body that gives them a firmness, is this, has spicules, like sponges, like you drew in your sponge notes, okay? They have five robes, rows of tube feet, that extend from end to end, from mouth to anus. And you may have seen this on social media, but they can eviscerate or shoot out, whatever, okay, um, their guts from either their mouth or their anus to distract predators. And it looks kind of yucky. And even the, um, uh, the predator could bite that and rip off some right? And then swim off with, hey, hey, I got a free meal, you know, and they will just regenerate those parts. So pretty cool. <clears throat> Crinoids. These things have been around for hundreds of millions of years. Here's a fossil one, okay? They look like um, 
plants. They look like flowers, but they're not. They're animals. There's about 600 species of them. And they use their outstretched feathery type arms, this one's in uh, Papua New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, uh, to, for feeding. And once in a while, they will swim, just like that. Quite an amazing thing. They, they look just like feathers. They look like the feather of a bird, and they swim around once in a while. But most of the time, they remain uh, on the bottom, and they'll walk around on the, uh, you know, on the bottom looking for uh, prey. So feather stars are kind of what we just saw, okay, as an example of um, a crinoid, okay? The first kind of crinoid is a feather star. And see how they walk around? They're just amazing. You think of it like, oh my gosh, that plant, that sea plant is walking around, but it's an animal, right? Okay. Tropical Pacific and Indian Oceans, we don't have any of those here in Florida, unfortunately but they're very neat. This one is all curled up, doesn't have its feeding arms out. Sea lilies are quite amazing. They've also been around for millions of years, and they, they're usually found in deep water only, and they attach themselves to the bottom, but sometimes if they get dislodged or for some environmental reason, they can crawl around. Because they're kind of just, they're in the same uh, phylum as, as, as sea stars, and sea stars can move around, so why can't these guys move around? It just looks really weird. It looks like a tree or a plant coming to life and like walking around on the bottom of the ocean. It's kind of strange looking, kind of otherworldly, right? But hey, every time they go down there, they discover new species of things. Pretty amazing. Remember, we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the bottom of the ocean. It's safer to go into space than it is to the bottom of the ocean. Remember that article we read? Okay, so what, uh, what going back to what we had to do with the uh, macroalgae, uh, you know, the kelp and the seagrass and, and the um, other things that we talked about, um, we have to know about the ecological and economic importance of certain species. And the first one is the crown of thorns sea star. Now, um, that's not on this page just yet. We'll get to that in a minute, okay? But some echinoderms are herbivores, like sea urchins and sand dollars, all right? So here, they, they're like cows. They're like spiky cow balls, okay? They're not mammals, obviously, but they move around almost in herds, and they just graze along eating algae, like grass, eating as they go over the rocks and over the bottom of the ocean. Um, and these are detritivores. Like I said before, they use those little um, suckerless tube feet to just move the soil around, move the sand grains around, and whenever they and they they move any food particles towards their mouth. Okay. Detritivore, remember, is feeding on dead, decaying matter at the bottom and the substrate. Sea urchins, certain species, will feed on kelp and other algae. Almost, they'll just work their way up and, and like a tree, like just eating it, you know? We had a lot of, we've had a lot of discussions about this relationship already between the keystone species um, and their uh, effects on uh, other organisms in the food chain, in the food web, right? Some sea stars, for example, are carnivores. And they will consume those bivalves, the clams, oysters, mussels, sponges, sand dollars. Um, I think you have a question. Uh, what do you think the term bivalve means? I kind of explained it before. Um, they will be in the next set of notes that we um, discuss, I believe. Okay. So here you see a sea star feeding on a clam, pulls it open. That's, that clam's pulled open way too wide. Here's another shot. Um, personal story, we had a very nice fish tank in New York years ago when my wife and I were first married, and we had a nice sea star in there, and I went out to the bay and brought back some clams, and I threw one of the clams living into the fish tank, and the sea star used its tube feet and 
they just pry it open just a little bit, just enough to eviscerate, not using that word again, their stomach through that crack and digest the clam from the inside out. And you may see clam shells washed up on the beach that are empty inside, but still kind of tight, just open a little bit, and that's because the sea star got it and did that. Um, but it destroyed the fish tank, okay? The waste product from this activity um, in a small contained area totally clouded the fish tank. And uh, needless to say, Mrs. Keene was not happy with me after I did that. Um, and then here comes the crown of thorns sea star, all right? The crown of thorns, this is what it looks like. It looks, it's got multiple arms, all right? And they live in the um, Barrier, Great Barrier Reef off the eastern shore of Australia. And they are major predators of coral. They're not invasive species. They belong there. It's just that sometimes there are environmental conditions uh, caused either by man or by nature that make their numbers grow more than we would like. And they start to decimate the coral population. And the coral, po coral populations around the world are already getting decimated by um, um, ocean uh, temperature changes, okay, and other things. So one of the ways that um, their numbers can climb is because of overfishing of their natural predator called the giant triton. And this is a giant triton. It's a great big snail that preys upon the crown of thorns sea star, okay? But we know, we understand at this point that ecological relationships can be disrupted when the population of one species is either grown or um, diminished, right? So we do understand those, those relationships. We've, we've studied them several times already, and that's what's happening here. And then the final slide is um, continuing the economic importance, okay, is that humans eat, some weird humans, um, some humans eat sea urchins and sea cucumbers. I would not if you paid me, unless I was starving, but then you wouldn't have to pay me, right? Um, eat one of these. <clears throat> Disgusting. Okay, but, um, and then some echinoderms, of course, are captured or raised um, for the, the aquarium industry. They, they make very good uh, aquarium pets, but you have to know how to take care of them. And the water chemistry has to be just right because they can be, uh, they're very sensitive. They, you know, just like us. If somebody, you know, kept us in a cage, enclosed, we would need the right amount of oxygen and the right type of water with the right acidity and the right number of electrolytes and everything to right temperature disrupt one of those things and we can get sick just like that. So that ends our notes for Echinodermata. You are now going to add an Echinoderm, Florida species specific, please, your information, to your field guide um, in your folders. Okay, so you're gonna spend the rest of the class time doing that.